hear the reading of Psalm 23, the favorite of many, many. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for the namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for, before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Hi, Zeke. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? I'm good. So we're going to continue to keep on following the lessons we're doing in VBS, but this is the adult lesson. Um, so we're going to, it's going to be a little bit more detailed and a little bit longer and have a little bit more information in it. Sound good? Mm-hmm. Okay. So our scripture today comes from John 4 and um, we're going to start in verse 1. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well's very deep. Where would you get living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give them will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring with them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, said the woman, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again and I won't have to come to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship? While we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshiped. Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while the Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed, it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then the disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? 
So the people came streaming from the village to see him. See him. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in the village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So Zeke, this is um, a really important story in John. And there's some things that uh, John's first readers would have known that maybe we don't catch quite as fast about this woman. So we're gonna kind of look at this woman a little bit and about her story. So the first thing um, that we need to notice right away is that she doesn't actually ever get a name. She doesn't get a name because she is an invisible person. Um, the next thing we know about her is that she's a Samaritan. And what we would not know, but they would have known that in the first reading, was that the Jews at that time, um, if you look at a map, Jerusalem's on the bottom, and then there's Samaria, and then there's Galilee. So you would think you'd have to go through Samaria to get to Galilee, right? Mm -hmm. But the Jews at that time knew that you wanted to avoid Samaria at all costs. You did not want to be in Samaria. You didn't want to know Samaritans. So you would actually go across the Jordan River into Gentile territory, go around Samaria, and then cross the Jordan again to avoid the Samaritan people. Which makes it really interesting that in our scripture today, Jesus says that he had to go to Samaria. He had to. So these are already a people that the Jewish people try to ignore, that they try to pretend don't exist. Um, a whole ethnic group that they are trying to um, avoid. But Jesus says he has to go see those people. So he goes to Samaria and then we know that he was there at noon at the well. So one thing that we don't know, because we have good indoor plumbing, and we can have water anytime we want, but one thing that the people there would have known is that in their world, where you didn't have indoor plumbing in every house, there would be a community well that everyone in town would go to to get their water. And that well, um, you would go first thing in the morning so that you would have water for your cooking, you'd have water for cleaning, you'd have water for all the things you needed to use it for. You would go first thing in the morning. And here in our story, we know that Jesus wasn't there first thing in the morning. When was he there? Do you in remember? the middle of the day. In the very middle of the day, the hottest part of the day. No one would go to the well at the hottest part of the day, except for one woman. So, we know that she is not just someone to be avoided because she's a Samaritan, but we know she's somebody who should be, who is avoiding other people. And that makes us kind of say, well, why was she avoiding all of these people? Why did she not want to be around them? And we get the answer when Jesus starts talking to her because she immediately says to Jesus, when he first asked her for a drink of water, he says, I said that one. When she first hears him ask for a drink of water, she says to him, why are you talking to me? I'm a Samaritan woman. And Jesus responds, he's, responds by saying he wants to follow protocol. Now the protocol is you don't talk to a woman by yourself during this time because people could assume that you're having an affair with a married woman. So he says, could you bring your husband? Because I want to talk to you some more. And she doesn't have a husband, we discover. She says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says something really interesting here. He says, oh, I know. I know you've had five husbands. And who you're with right now, he's not your husband at all. And she at this point is like kind of bewildered because that's probably the reason why 
she was avoiding other people in town. She probably came to the well because she did not want to come when the other women were there who would be making fun of her or um, talking behind her back, who would be giving her nasty looks or making her feel worthless. You know, she, five husbands, we don't know exactly what happened. We don't know if she had been kicked out of the house or um, if they had died. But we do know that that's like really traumatic on a person. So we know that she probably, she had had some trauma in her life and that the reaction of the community was to distance themselves from her. And her reaction was to distance herself from the community. She, that her life was hard enough that she chose to be invisible. She chose to go to the well when no one else would be there. Jesus met her there and he talked with her even knowing that. He met her where she was and he connected with her and spoke to her and said, I see you. I see you and you can be part of God's kingdom. Do you know, Zeke, that in psychology, there's um, what's called the Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Have you ever heard of that? No. It's this pyramid, and in it, uh, the this psychologist named Maslow, um, he said there are certain needs that every human has. And so he ranked them of what you need first, what you need second, what you need third. And the goal is to be self-actualized, a whole healthy human being. So the first one, can you guess what that might be? What do we need to live? Food. That's right. The first line was food, water, shelter. The second one was safety. That makes sense, right? You need to know you're safe to, to reach your highest potential. Do you know what the third thing on his chart was? People. It's belonging. It's being accepted by other people, being seen, being heard, being part of a community. That's how important it is for people to belong. That right after you have food and shelter, you know you're safe. The next most important thing is to be part of a group. And what Jesus did for this lady was that he helped her to be seen and to be heard and to be part of his community. You know, she was so excited by what Jesus had told her that she ran into town and told everyone about Jesus. Those people that she had been ignoring every single day, that she had avoided seeing every single day, she ran to them and told them about Jesus. That's pretty remarkable. And what's really cool is that for her little town, she is like John the Baptist, that she made the way for Jesus to come into the town and tell the people about God and about the kingdom that was coming. She made the way for Jesus. So she went from this woman who doesn't even have a name to being someone who is like John the Baptist and, and how she brings God's kingdom to her community. Zeke, have you ever felt like the outsider? Like maybe you went to a party and everyone was talking to everyone else and no one came and talked to you. Maybe you walked in and into a situation and everybody had nicer clothes than you. Um, were important people in the community. Um, they had maybe more money than you. And you looked at them and you were like, wow, these are not my people. I do not fit in here. That's kind of like the woman at the well. And you know, lots of us have felt like that before. Have felt like we've been in situations where we do not fit in. Where we are ignored or not listened to where um, when we try to speak up, people belittle us and make us feel like this big. 
And in those moments, we remember that Jesus values the woman without the name, right? That Jesus loves the people who don't fit in, the, the women at the well. But you know, sometimes you might uh, be at a party and you do fit in, they are your people. You know, you are the cool person in the room. That because we have the power, we have the opportunity to welcome and include the people around us. And, you know, sometimes churches get a little confused and we think about, um, we hear that we should be a friendly church. And what we usually mean when we say friendly is that we should be polite, right? Mm -hmm. And we should say hello to each other, maybe ask how you are doing. But when we ask how you're doing, we don't really want to know how you're doing. We just expect them to say, oh, I'm good, and then kind of move on. So we tend to be polite um, and nice, but we don't tend to reach out and connect with people and help them to belong. And that's really what Jesus's people do, that they reach out and help people to belong. So that the woman at the well ends up with a name. So that everyone listens to her story and her testimony of what Jesus has done in her life. So that's what we're called to do as a church. We're not just called to be friendly. We're called to be a friend to other people. We're called to include people in a way where they feel like they belong. God, we thank you for your presence among us, no matter where we worship and where we discover your truth and spirit. God, help us that feel like the woman at the well. Help us to know that we are worthy of being your children and that you call us and meet us where we are, no matter how awkward we may feel we are. And God, help us when we find ourselves being the townspeople, when we t find ourselves excluding others, whether intentional or unintentional, Lord, Open our ears to hear those who need to belong. Help us to include those who need to belong. Help us to be more like Jesus every day. Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all 